welcome to Women's Cricket Chat. I'm Hannah. And I'm Alexandra, Alex for short. Coming up on today's podcast, we've got Central Sparks captain Evelyn Jones. Evelyn Jones is a former England Academy player and we talked to her about her career path and where she's got to today, what it's like being captain of the Sparks. And we also talk about when she's not playing cricket, how she's still involved in the game by coaching. Thank you so, so much for joining us this morning. First question, I guess, is just reflecting on this summer. So obviously it's a completely new structure. Tell us about kind of the Central Sparks and what you've kind of taken out of this season. It's a bit of a crazy summer, to be honest. Um, with everything that's going on with COVID, we, we weren't sure if we were going to play or not. But obviously it's fantastic that we were able to. And I think um, especially with the, the Central Sparks, it's a brand new team. So it's lots of excitement around the group and around the West Midlands with that. So, yeah, it was great, really. Um, so when we did get to play cricket, we had a fairly decent season. And especially considering we're a brand new team, we were literally just chucked together in, I think it was July, August, we started training. But that again, that was sort of individualised and in small groups because people work and people were in different bubbles, etc. So we didn't have too many full team sessions before the start of the comp. And I think when we started training, we weren't sure whether we were going to play or not. So, But we were really just, just happy to be playing and training and, and be with other people as well, I suppose. So, yeah, once we got the green light that we are going to play, that was, that was great for us. Do you think sort of being a new team and not having many sessions together, do you think it could have potentially hindered your performance or do you think it could have helped it? Probably a bit of both, really. So for me, I, I only signed for Warwickshire this year and then the team sort of made up of a few different counties. So we've got players from Staffordshire, well, Shropshire formerly, Warwickshire, Worcestershire. Yeah, so we sort of never never played together before. I know a few of the Warwickshire girls obviously had and the Worcester girls had. But yeah, so I think it, it could have, but it didn't. I think we were all just happy to be playing cricket. So I don't think there was any issues with that. And yeah, so no, I don't think, I, no, I think it was good. And who kind of stood out for you in the season? Because obviously he has quite a few different like kind of key performers, quite a few of the girls kind of stood up, but who was the one that really kind of impressed you most? There's a few really. As you said, there's a few that stood up and, and performed when we needed to really. So we had Marie Kelly who played a great innings early doors. We had Gwen Davis who got a few scores under her belt. Uh, Liz Russell, who never seems fail. And then I think the, the one that stood out for me was um, Hannah Baker. She came in, I think it was the third game third or fourth game up at Headingley made a debut not a bad place to make your debut and she sort of changed the game for us really she took three crucial wickets and, and got us back in it and the way she bowled she had so much control and she didn't seem phased by it all or anything and she had a, a parents there to watch which was which was really good and and yeah she stayed in the team for the rest of the games and and, and still performed so I think she was the one that went a bit under the radar at the start and just really proved that she deserved to be there. On your captaincy as well, how difficult has it been to try and like build the team culture in such a short time? It's not been too tough, I don't think. Um, I think when when we first got the call off law about the contracts, etc., we we sort of started to try and make that legacy from from day one about the central sparks and who we are, etc. So we tried to do a bit of the work before we even got to training. Plus that just kept us busy anyway because we were sort of stuck at home, nothing to do. So that was quite nice just to start making the brand really. And then once everybody started to filter back in training, we sort of thought about what we want to what we want to look like, how we want to behave, how we want to play, etc. So we just sort of rolled with it, really. We didn't have to force anything and everyone sort of slotted in well and gelled well and went from there. But yeah, it was, it was really nice, actually. It was um, great to be part of the Central Sparks and it's a brand new team. So we sort of paving the way for the girls in the future, really. And I think just quickly on that as well. So what does the kind of brand look like to you? So like, what are the key messages behind the scene? Nothing too out of the ordinary, really. It's just about representing the West Midlands and... Obviously, we've got loads of history there with the revolution and et cetera. Um, and we just want to try and portray that and just be courageous, like always try and take the positive option, take the game on and, and explore our different skills that we can gain along the way as well. So, yeah, I think it's just being really positive and enjoying ourselves and uh, just showing the West Midlands off as much as we can. Do you feel a sense of pressure sort of representing the whole of the West Midlands as the Central Sparks? Very relaxed. I think it's quite nice that we are representing the whole West Midlands, whereas some of the other teams are just representing 
from like a city or a, one county. So I think it is really nice that we've got girls from all the different counties that are able to, to represent the West Midlands. And I think that will help with our supporters as well. Like, like they can see that a local girl from Worcester's playing for the Central Sparks, then that might make them want to support us, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. I think that's huge. I guess looking at some of the other kind of structures, it's not as perhaps local, like you mentioned. So it's not drawing on that local talent as much, maybe. I'm not too sure. But what's it been the kind of like access like and opportunity training facilities? Has that been different to what you've experienced before? Yeah, we've obviously had to be a lot more careful this year and stick to protocols in line with COVID and the government. Um, But we've been really fortunate. We've got two great home grounds with Worcester and Warwickshire. So we've been doing pretty much all our training at Warwickshire at Edgebaston. So the facilities there are are, are great. Can't fault them at all. And and the the ground staff and the stadium team are brilliant uh, and giving us the opportunities to train as, as often as we do. Even over the summer, we were there probably two, three times a week. So yeah, it's it's been great to get there. And obviously the facilities are world class. So and then even when we got out to Worcester in the sea to play our games the facilities there were great we had a couple of training sessions before matches in and around the the ground everyone was really welcoming so yeah it's, it was great to be there as well you spoke beforehand about inspiring kind of girls and being a role model <laughs> tell us a little bit about what that does mean to you Obviously, it's a dream come true to to get a professional contract. It's something I've worked really hard for, probably for as long as I can remember. I've always wanted to play cricket professionally. So it's, yeah, it's great. When Laura rang me up and, and told me, I was, it was sort of like a weight off the shoulders, really, because it was sort of all the work that I've put in has paid off. So, yeah, it's great that there's four others as well that have got the same opportunity. So to be able to represent the West Midlands and inspire the next generation is great. And I think for me, from coming from Shropshire, which is quite a, small county on the cricket scale it's hopefully given the girls around this area something to aspire to and know that they can do it and I think with me coaching as well I coach quite a few of the girls in Shropshire so having that relationship with them they can see that they can do it so hopefully in years to come we're gonna have a few more Shropshire players in the West Midlands and, and beyond so um yeah it's, it's it's an exciting time and hopefully the same for the other counties they can all their youngsters can can see that their role models within the county are, are playing for the Central Sparks and the West Midlands and they see that they can they can do it and there is opportunities there now so yeah it's, re- it's really good and I think it's only going to get better in the years to come. How much do you think seeing more female professional cricketers, how much do you think it's going to move the game forward? Well, hopefully it's going to bridge the gap between England and Australia. I think that's the main goal having the extra players training full time so every region's got their five players I think Western Storm got six it's only going to increase the standard and to be able to train full time and not worry about having to earn a living elsewhere will allow us to put all our focus into playing cricket and be training all winter is great and and hopefully next summer we'll see some really exciting cricket even though last year was pretty good but there's a lot of highlights I think I think next year is going to be a really exciting summer especially with the 100 ball as well so hopefully we'll see a few of the regional players stepping up in that and, and performing. Just thinking about kind of your pathway to where you are now what was it like growing up playing for Shropshire and also like moving counties before kind of like the KSL came along? Yeah, so I, I still live in Shropshire and I played all my junior cricket here and uh, I think I first played my I think it was for the under, under 11s or under 13s. I was about nine or 10, I think, in my first game. So back then, like just to see how far cricket's come between then and now, it was just it's just phenomenal. And I think even at that age, I think I played against Warwickshire under 15s when I was about nine or 10. And I was literally so out of my depth. We were so short. We had no players. And um, But even that, I thought, wow, they're so good. And now to, to see the girls playing at Shropshire under 15s and Shropshire under 17s, like they've come on leaps and bounds and they are closing the gap on other counties. There are players from Shropshire in the trialling for the Spark Academy. So it is coming on a, a long way. And I think for me, playing for Shropshire, I then went on to play for a Shropshire ladies team so I was there for a few years and then I decided to move to play for Staffordshire just to play at a higher standard I think that came about I was playing an MC, MCC game with Danny Wyatt and got friendly with her and she was like come and play at staff so I was like right okay I'll play at staffs so I played it for about five five seasons there we were in Div 2 and then I think we got promoted to Div 1 um, so we played quite a decent standard and then I think it was that year I played for Loughborough Lightning that was the first year of the KSL so obviously that was like another another step up playing in the KSL with some of the best players in the world and then yeah from there I, I then spoke to Bobby Cross from Lancashire 
and he mentioned about making a double move to play for Manx in the county system and then also for Lancashire Thunder and said about open the bat in there. So for that, I was like going to get a better opportunity. So that's where that came about. Um, so obviously first year at Lancashire, we had a crazy season. We managed to win the double, which is probably one of my career highlights. So yeah, that was, and we sort of did it out of nowhere and it was so many close games and I think we were waiting on a, on a result from another game. I think we were waiting for knots to, to cling on or something and it was just a mad day. But yeah, we uh, we managed to do the double and then KSL and um, having the opportunity to open the bat in that was great for me. It was a, obviously a good challenge facing some of the best ballers in the world opening up, facing the new ball. So yeah, that, that was that was good. And then when we got to, then that was three years ago. So I played with them three years and then... I spoke to Laura actually at the end of last summer and then she was speaking to me about sort of a triple move. So playing for Warwickshire, Birmingham Phoenix and then the regional um, system, which hadn't actually come about yet, but it was sort of in the pipeline back then. But that even then, from then to now, it's crazy how much that's come on. So, um, yeah, I decided to, to make the move back to the Midlands and, and here we are today. Just picking up on what you said earlier about mixing with more well-known players in the international players, how beneficial do you think that's been for your career just to ask for advice and stuff like that? Yeah, it's, it's obviously great to be around them when they're training and you see what they sort of, how they go about things and what they do in training that makes them stand out from the rest. I remember playing first year of the KSL, we had Elise Perry there and I just remember how calm she was no matter what the situation was, whether we were under the pump, whether we were about to lose and she was like, no, come on, keep going. And I think we actually managed to win a game from them needing five runs to win or something from the last over or two overs. But I just remember how calm she was on the group, the calming influence. And then also at Lanks, I've had Amy Satterthwaite, who's been a great like sort of mentor and friend to me. So with her being a fellow lefty, we had quite a few discussions and the nets around batting and different options and talking about the different bowlers as well and, and what we can do to to overcome their plans and and sort of make it into a strength of ours so yeah that it's been good to to pick their brains really and, and and sort of try and copy in a sense what what they do in some sort of thing so I think for Amy I think a big thing I got from her was that manipulating the single so if you've got a bowler a lot of it's to the left hander who's coming across us so you're just trying to manipulate that single down to third man and just little things like that and stance in the crease positioning all that sort of stuff it's it's been really helpful. When you talk about kind of like bowling plans batting plans and stuff like that I think People perhaps like listening in and outside might not actually know what that kind of means. So could you kind of explain what kind of is a batting plan and what is a bowling plan and how you kind of approach it? Yeah, sure. Um, so as a batter, I'm going to be facing the new ball and bowlers. Well, it's, you've got to try and sort of assess um, as quickly as possible what their plan is. So if they're trying to bowl the ball outside off some swing it away, they're going to might have their slip, gully, offside sort of dominant field, trying to get you to try and go across the line if there's not many fielders on the leg side or you they might have a fairly even field and trying to tap stamp so I think it's just trying to work out as quickly as you can what what it, what it is they're trying to do and how they're trying to get you out so sometimes I just change my guard sometimes I stand deep in my crease sometimes I'll stand out my crease depending on the pitch so I think it's just trying to work out quickly what what it is they're trying to do and I think from a personal perspective I think this is the things you try in the nets. So sometimes I'll just try and, even if I'm hitting half volleys really well, I might just try and make it a bit more difficult and stand outside my crease or or stand and off stump just to try different things. And sometimes you never actually you realise you the stuff there that you that you might actually add to your game. Some some stuff you might not. You just bin it. But I think it's just experimenting nets, especially over the winter period. Like now is a great time to be experimenting with with different options and different plans. I know a lot we've done a bit before Christmas with the Sparks about trying to hit over the top and that back path. I think some of that is is great to do beforehand. So we're trying to get all that work done before Christmas. And then as we sort of lead into the season, we, we go into a bit more scenario based stuff and facing bowlers to try and limit how much we use the ball machines for. So that's what I'd say for a batting perspective. I think bowlers probably not the best person to speak to about this, but um, I think. For instance, had Izzy Wong last year, she she was really clear on her field pacing. So which as a captain, that's great because I don't really want to be setting a field for a bowler that 
they're not sure where they're going to bowl, so it's quite difficult. But um, the girls were really good last year, actually. I think Wongi especially leading, leading from the front with her plans, and she was really clear on what she wanted to do. And she's like, right, I want one, two, three, four on the leg side towards the death, and she's just going to try and bowl into the legs, bowl at the stumps. So, yeah, that's sort of a little insight into it, really. don't want to give all my plans away. <laughs> Before we go on to a bit about your coaching and everything, I just wanted to bring up MCC. So what opportunities have you had with the MCC in the past and stuff? Because obviously we met, uh, I can't remember what the first match we met was, but we definitely went to obviously China and Hong Kong. And I think I might have been a bit of an annoying fresher. I was ill, <laughs> I kept you up all night. So I was a terrible kind of roommate. But yeah, t- tell us a bit about kind of any kind of stories you've got from MCC and what that's given you and your career. Yeah, it's been great playing with the MCC. I think, as I said, I, I met Danny Wyatt through the MC, playing an MCC game and that prompted my move to Staffordshire. So I think that's helped with my career. And I think it's just having the opportunities. You don't know what arises from, from playing the MCC games. First and foremost, they're great to play and the tees are phenomenal, as I'm sure you'll agree. But no, it's it's, it's great to, to play with all these different players from around the, around the country, really. And, and you can sort of play whichever game you want. You have to apply for them. But... I think the grounds you play at and the people you meet are, are, are what it's all about and they generate some great friendships going forward and the tour as you said the tour was great wasn't it <laughs> I know you were a bit ill for it I forgot about that <laughs> but it's not the best place to be ill in China is it and there's lots of fish about and and, and that kind of food so um, no China was great wasn't it I probably can't tell all the stories from the tour but to play at Hong Kong I think Hong Kong Cricket Club was like amazing wasn't it the ground looking over the city was great but yeah just to with that you sort of play it we played against who did we play against China's first team didn't we and uh Hong Kong cricket club first yeah so um I think to play against those kind of players you sort of see how they go about their things and their cultures as well it's it's great for, for everyone on a like on a learning basis as well isn't it and to see what their grounds are like I think we played on an artificial pitch at one place didn't we so it's great to, to have the opportunity to to try these things out and just the experience of going on tour as well is great isn't it so um yeah I love that and uh, hopefully well I think I applied for a few last year but obviously they got cancelled so fingers crossed this year we can play a few more MCC games yeah, definitely. Talking about confidence, how do you kind of instill that kind of belief into the younger girls that you do coach? And tell us a little bit about the coaching that you've done in the past. And When you coach, you just got to try and make your sessions as fun as possible. And obviously, if, if you don't enjoy playing, then you're not going to get too much out of it. So I think trying to encourage that cricket is a game. Of, it's a game. It's a sport. It's it's there for enjoyment. So I think just trying again to love the game as, as much as we do, really. But yeah, I've, I've sort of been coaching since I was about 17 now. And the last few years, I've been head coach of the Shropshire under 15s and 17s girls, which is great to sort of still be involved with Shropshire. Because obviously I don't play here now. So be able to give back to, to them is great. And um, they've even got an EPP girls only squad now. So um, they've had that run in the last two or three years. So they're sort of trying to forge that pathway as well there. So yeah, it's great to to be involved with the different age groups. I think even last year I did some of the under 13, so they were literally only just starting a few of them. So it's good. And I, I like doing, I like coaching sort of all different age groups. I quite enjoy the, with the under 13s, it's sort of literally a lot about that enjoyment. And then as you go on 15, 17s, they're sort of there because they, they want to be there and they want to get better. So with that, I can be a bit more technical and tactical with them and try and pass on things that I've experienced so yeah it's it's really good and I enjoy it still and it's a good sort of aspect away from playing so it gets me away from playing and then I like the balance of it as well so it's something I'm going to still continue to do in the the future and then apart from that as away from that as well I'm I coach usually in school so I've been doing a lot at Ellesmere College before the lockdown and before Christmas so I do a lot of one-to-ones there with mainly the boys but we've had a few more girls wanting to join in this year so um yeah it's been um it's been good to to do that as well and that sort of fills my week up really with the training three times a week and then coaching the other two so yeah, it's good enjoy it. You're talking about making your sessions fun and making cricket fun how have you adapted your coaching sessions due to Covid? Well, a lot of them haven't actually taken place because 
because of COVID. So we've had a lot of cancellations. The ones I've still been able to do at school, obviously on a one-to-one basis, they're sort of similar to to what I've been doing previously because we're sort of in a different bubble. But I think it's just being really conscious of me picking the balls up and trying to limit contact and staying dis- two metre distance away and, and stuff like that really. But apart from that, it's probably similar to, to what we usually do with working on the bowling machines, doing different drills and stuff. So similar stuff really, but it's just trying to be con- conscious of staying safe and, and sticking to the guidelines as well. And with that as well, so you're a coach educator now as well. So has that been something that you always wanted to kind of achieve? And what impact do you think you can have with that kind of new qualification and role? It's probably not something I thought too much about, but when the opportunity arose to do my coach developer course, it was in 2019, I think it was. So yeah, it's something I was up to try and do as much as I can to with the education stuff, like try and add other strings to my to my bow. So yeah, it's something I wasn't specifically lucky enough going to do, but then I didn't really know much about it, to be honest. But yeah, when I got told about it, I was like, yeah, I'll do that. Something extra, isn't it? But since doing it, it was a great course. I think it was a couple of weekends at Edgebaston. And I think for me, it took me right out of my comfort zone, which obviously it's not very nice taking yourself out of your comfort zone, but it's something I always try and push myself to do. So delivering a course to, I don't know, 16 people, it's not something I'm probably used to doing. So we actually got one in before Christmas, before the lockdown. So that was my second course that I ran. It was the Foundation One course, which is the old level one. Um, So I love doing it. It's great to to sort of bring on new coaches to to the system and to the family really because you never know where they might go back and and coach and who they might be coaching the next I don't know have a night potentially so um it's always good to to have that in the back of the mind that you got to try and make sure you do this really well to then pass on all your education and knowledge to them to to then go back and be able to coach the young players and in in the right way and yeah you never know who they might coach and how well they might coach and they might bring on the next superstar maybe or the next central sparks opening batter definitely and how important is saying yes to opportunities that perhaps are slightly different we had a, a pca meeting a few weeks back and um we were informed about i think it was the umpire in level one course so that's something i'm potentially looking at, at doing in the next few weeks or month depending on how much time i get i've been quite busy recently so i've not had time to do it yet but that's something i'm potentially looking at doing I think that will bring in that viewpoint from the other side, won't it, really? So as a player, you just sort of see it in one way. So I think if I have that under my belt, it obviously helps with your knowledge of the game as well and, and sort of you'll see it from the other side then as well. So And I think in women's cricket especially, I think umpiring has only sort of come to light really in the last few years. I think Sue Redfern within the West Midlands is a great example of, of female umpires. She umpired a few of our games in the Rachel Hoho Flint Trophy last year. And I think she she's umpired me in a in a Whitchurch men's game before in the Birmingham League. So um it's great actually to rock up to a game when you're playing men's cricket and, and have a female umpire. Quite nice. You're not the only only female out on the pitch. Um so yeah, it's something I'm potentially looking at doing in the near future. You never know what the opportunity might bring in like post playing career day. So um yeah, that's something I'm probably gonna do. How important would you say for the women's game especially is it to have female umpires? Yeah, it's obviously important to have female umpires. I think as a female that's played a lot of men's cricket, you rarely see other females on the pitch. So it's nice to like for someone like Sue to to be there and and I think if they're if they're good enough, then there's no reason why why they shouldn't be out there. And I think it's great last year we had quite a few females umpiring our games. So I think looking forward to the future, I think if we can keep encouraging females to, to get involved in umpiring and scoring and playing itself and I know that um, coaching as well. So I think if you can keep encouraging females to get involved in whatever way or shape or form, it's going to help female cricket and female sport in the long run. So we've just spoken about potential post-playing career options, but do you still have your England hopes? And do you think England are missing a trick by not having enough left-handed batters? I mean, there's not many like opening left-handed batters in the side. Exactly. There aren't any left-handed batters. Is there not? No, no, like outright batter. Oh my god, he's getting the bad deal all the time. Like, I think it just proves how good Australia are. Like, they've got so many lefties in their team. Yeah, 
I don't know, to be fair though, it would be interesting to see. I think with the regional structures though, I think hopefully you'll see more transition of players, like more player movement, because I think like personally from my kind of perception, obviously I don't really know the ins and outs and stuff, but it seems like those who've had the central contracts, it's quite fixed. It's quite, once you're in your ear thing, there's not as much movement. So now hopefully it does mean more people are knocking at the door and there is that opportunity to like play in a series and stuff like that. Because that's what happens in the men's game, isn't it? There's lots of movement yeah. up stuff but and I think I think that's the good thing about this competition like I think last year it showed that there is talent underneath England that are performing consistently and and are still knocking on the door despite whatever age you are there's players always scoring runs and there's players always taking wickets and I think that it might just give those above a bit of a nudge so yeah we'll, we'll see but yeah just quickly on that you just reminded me of the idea about like age so especially being a woman age kind of gets brought into the question quite early on as soon as you get anywhere near 30 it's kind of like when are you going to retire not oh how can we make her last longer kind of thing it's always kind of oh so what are you going to do post-career what are you going to do yeah and that and it's like you you never really see those questions in the men's game so much it's like yeah, it's quite article, frustrating yeah there's like an article um recently with joe root celebrating that he's 30 years young and <laughs> he's still got a long way to go and a lot that he can give to England. I, I was like, that's such a good attitude. I wish that was seen more in the women's game. So just tell us a little bit about how it makes you feel when people do kind of like perhaps write you out of the game before your time. Yeah, I think there is that stigma about, isn't there, about when you're getting late 20s, you sort of past it in a sense, which is a load of nonsense. I think I think that's I'm now at the time where I am actually feel probably the best that I've ever felt. And I know my game inside out. I know myself a lot better so I think and especially in the men's game they're like oh they just come into age uh, when they're 28 29 30 and then that's literally the opposite in the women's they're like oh 21 yeah they're they're at the peak and no they're not like I know especially as a bat, bats person I was never gonna be at my peak at 21 22 like you don't experience that much as much that you do now like we've had them extra five six years where you're still playing cricket still like I've been abroad and played so I've got them experiences as well so yeah I think now I'm I'm sort of get, getting into my peak of my career so yeah it's a load of nonsense that, <laughs> that they say you, you passed it when you get to 27 28 29 so there's definitely a quite a good kind of like cohort of perhaps a, li- a little bit older because it's not old either is it like 30 is still young like but there's a growing kind of cohort we've got kind of like Phoebe Graham and she's 29 leaving her job at Sky and stuff I think that kind of proves it as well that there's still time when you get close to 30 it's not that's it you're out it's there's mm-hmm. still an opportunity here for sure yeah and I, and I think I was listening to Georgia Adams's podcast and she was saying how she she's always struggled with finding consistency and I think last year proved that that she's sort of finding that consistency and she's what mid late 20s so I think that just proves that as a 22 23 year old you're not at your peak you, you don't know your game as well as you do down the line for a few years down the line same for someone like Sophie Love like she had a good season so and I know personally like last year I felt so so clear with what I was trying to do and and I think that just comes with that experience and and that time, isn't it, of, of just keep plugging away and keep growing runs and learning and experiencing different things. And yeah, so hopefully, hopefully that'll change the stigma of that'll change very, very soon, actually. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. But fingers crossed. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. So honestly, I think that message just needs to be like heard by so many and especially the media, because that's what I get frustrated by, because. I'm like analysing like media coverage and stuff with my PhD. It's just that constant kind of battle, I think. I'm like, you're creating a narrative around a player before they've even kind of stepped out onto a pitch. Exactly, yeah. And it's just so frustrating. It's just frustrating the difference between the men, how they perceive it with the men and how they perceive it with the women. Like, and I think a good thing that Australia have done, obviously Erin Burns made a debut, was she 30 or 31? So obviously the stigma over there is slightly different. Like, I don't think anyone's made their debut. I can't think, I saw it the other day. Um, was it Sonia or Becky Grundy? No yeah, one's made their debut. Yeah, I think it was Sonia um, Adira at 25. I think yeah. that was the oldest. That's the oldest person to make the debut isn't it for England at 25 so hopefully that's going to change soon and I think p- the performances that people put up last year proves that we're not past our best. Tell us a little bit about what you do outside of cricket. Well I've just bought a house at the end of last year so um, 
it's crazy times really I found out I hate DIY after spending pretty much my whole Christmas at the house doing sanding painting just stuff like that I've sort of had enough now but we're sort of seeing light at the end of the tunnel so I'm getting my new floor put into it's exciting and I'm, I'm getting excited about things that I'd never thought I'd get excited about for instance I've got headlights on my hoover so yeah exciting times so that's sort of taken up my life for the last few months and then apart from that it's not too much outside cricket I like watching cricket on the tv I try and stay up and watch a bit of the test before I go to bed and super smash is on the tv as well so um I can normally get through one innings, but then um, the shutters come down and I'm lights out then. So, yeah, cricket, really. Um, now, obviously, my coaching and coach developing. What else? I'm trying to, this is actually a really tough question. What do I like outside cricket? You used to play football as well, or did I make that up? Yeah, so as, as a kid, I, I used to play football, not for not for a high, high level or anything, just my local team. I used to do a lot of swimming as well. Um, I think that's where I got my broad shoulders from. So, yeah, I've always been sporty. And as a kid, I was doing different clubs like every night of the week. My poor mum and dad were driving me everywhere to do that. And then also played the clarinet and the piano. But I've not played it for a long time. So I hate to say that I've probably forgotten it all now. (laughs) Sorry, mum. So, yeah, I've always tried to keep active and keep sort of developing myself in different ways like music. And yeah, so that's about it, really completely sort of understand about forgetting everything you've learned on the piano because I probably can't even remember anything on the piano or the violin so I'm totally with you on that one and I I think I can just about read music which is something while we're on the topic of um, music what's been your go-to genre of music during lockdown and this crazy time of covid oh I get a bit of stick for this if we're in the gym so since we've been back training I was like what should we put on I'm like 80s I love a bit of 80s so I normally get through a couple of songs and then I normally get binned off for something new and in the charts now so I don't I don't really mind too much I like any music really I'm not too fussy but yeah I'm big into my 80s over the lockdown I think I think that's just because my dad's had his playlist on a lot at home in the summer so I was like oh that's a good song so just add that to my playlist and then then when we get in the gym I was like no <laughs> get off but I think that's where I'm showing my age a bit as well obviously the oldest in the team so yeah I don't think they're they're too keen on my uh, music taste what I get a little bit confused about now is kind of those 2000 and kind of like nine classics those kind of proper bangers that I love it now I'm like oh my god yeah I haven't heard that in ages and like now kids are like oh my god you're so old and that's so ancient and I'm like this was kind of childhood like well teenage years kind of growing up and stuff but (laughs) I guess it's hard to kind of win over the changing rooms, I guess, if, you, if you've got poor music taste. <laughs> I, I wouldn't exactly say it's poor. I think it's great. I think they're just tough, tough listeners. They don't know what real music is. Tough crowds. You need to educate them. I know. Well, I'm trying to slowly. I'll keep sliding a few more songs in on the playlist. So one day, maybe. What is the balance like then? So have you got kind of like Beyonce one minute followed by like Wham or something? Or is it a bit more subtle than that um no it's probably spot on um I literally have a bit of everything on there <laughs> I can't even think what I've got let me just look yeah I've got a few like chart ones and then my rogue one could be something let me have a look I'll get my dad play, dad's playlist a bit of Kenny Rogers for goodness sake <laughs> Elton John yes yeah, so a bit of the Beatles I love the Beatles so yeah it could be a bit of anything you never know I will, I'm always a bit nervous to what's coming on next to be honest so is this so, the yeah. same playlist that you listen to when you're going into bat or do you have a separate one for that? No, I normally just listen to whatever somebody, I've normally been kicked off the off the speaker. So whatever anyone's got on, I just listen to. I'm not too fussy, I'm quite chilled with that. It's normally something bouncing off the, off the walls that you listen to before you go out to battlefield anyway. So I don't mind, it gets you pumped. Perfect. Should we do some quick fire questions, Alex? Yeah, sure. Best friend in the team? Gwen Davis. Worst music choice. As in, who has the worst music choice? Yeah. Yeah. Marie Kelly. <laughs> oh, I thought you were confidently about to go, me. And I was <laughs> getting, no, no, no. I, I was getting so hyped for that. I was like, oh, you just told us how amazing it is. I and mean, you're just like, yeah, I'm still bad. <laughs> Who's got the um, worst fashion sense in the team? 
Oh, um, probably Wongi, although she probably thinks it's cool. I don't know. She wears some random stuff. That just might be me being old. Worst sledger. That's quite possibly Gwen. Yeah, definitely Gwen. Best person to train with in the team. Mm. Millie Home is a little gem. Who's the teacher's pet or coach's pet in this case? Probably Thea Brooks or Chloe Hill. We stitched you right up with that. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Worst temper on the field. Gwen Davis, definitely, hands down. Best banter. Ooh, that's a good one. I'm just trying to think back to the games. They seem so far, like, so long away. I know it is Russell. So who does it for the gram? Who does it for the gram? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to go Claire Boycott. She loves a little salute when she gets a wicket. Who's always on their phone? Probably everybody. Well, we ban phones when we're training and at games. So away from that, probably everybody. I don't know. I can't. I don't know. Worst car driver in the team? Wongi. I think she crashed from coming... No, no, she didn't. She, she didn't crash. She uh, drove through some cones on the way back from Loughborough in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> like some... There's a little area of the roundabout, like, coned off or something. I think she went straight through it. <laughs> Last book you read? Oh, my God. Bounce. I don't know who it's by. I can't remember. Um, no. Was it Matthew Said? No. Ooh. No, I don't think it was actually by him. I don't know. <laughs> That just shows how often I read books. I don't like books. Last TV show you binged? Prison Break. I'm still binging. Yeah, I'm not, I've never really been a series person, but since lockdown, my boyfriend's made me watch loads of old series that I've never watched. Um, so I've watched Game of Thrones and now I'm like deep into Prison Break, but I've still got probably about 80 episodes to go. There's that many. I love Prison Break. It's so I good. I can't believe I never, it's so old, I've never watched it. <laughs> I need to I'm ashamed of myself. That. It's great. If you've got a load of, lots of time. I just really watch that. Brooklyn Nine-Nine, like that, that's my go-to show at the minute. I've not seen that one. It's quite funny. Maybe after Prison Break. Maybe. Perfect. Alex, have you got any other questions or shall we let Eve escape? Because we've taken more than more than at the time we kind of planned for as well <laughs> no I haven't really got any questions but I am just gonna quickly say this um so Eve where can our listeners find you on social media if they want to follow your progress or just see what you're about so both Twitter and Instagram are the same at Eve underscore Jones 11 I think I, that. <laughs> I should know by now but I just always like when I'm put under pressure I think all oh, right what is it actually that yeah I don't know if you can see that yeah yeah perfect cool yeah, so by me, I don't know if I'm that interesting to follow, but... <laughs> oh, there was a bit of banter on there. I was like, I'll have a quick look and see if there's anything that can put some more interview questions. And, you know, it's Instagram on fleek or whatever kids say these days. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I definitely don't say that. On Nor fleek, I'm dead. Oh, is it? See, that's how, you know, I thought I was getting down for kids there, but clearly not. <laughs> I mean, if you have to say you're down with the kids, then you're not down with the kids. <laughs> Yeah, I realised that as I said it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely getting on a bit, as everybody keeps telling me to. You know, it's fine. Thank you so, so much for sparing your morning stuff and chatting to us. No, thanks for having me. It's been great to chat. Yeah, no, thank you. And best of luck with all your winter stuff. And thank you. And, and I'll the probably DIY. Badge Pardon? And good luck with all the DIY you've got left. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Massive thank you to Evelyn Jones for coming on the podcast this week. And to all our listeners, if you want to keep up to date with everything we're doing, you can follow us on Twitter at WCricketChat and on Instagram at Women's Cricket Chat. And if you want to give us a like on Facebook, we are Women's Cricket Chat. And if you wanted to give our personal Twitters a follow, Hannah is at HannahT1194 and I'm at Alex Jane Pereira. This has been Women's Cricket Chat. Tune in next time. Bye.